What's your reaction when you hear news that the former president of the United States has been indicted? This is the so-called January 6th indictment. He's been indicted for acts while he was in office. It's a pretty unprecedented moment. What's your reaction when you hear that news, when you, when you first read the indictment? I, I think the first reaction, anybody's first reaction, and, and also the same reaction as a, a former prosecutor, is that it is unprecedented. I mean, we are traveling in un, uncharted waters. So you can use all of the experience you have and impressions that you have, but it's obvious that there will be surprises along the way. No one really knows how this is going to unfold, when it's going to unfold, and uh, what conclusion um, there will be when it's all over. And I think anybody who thinks they can safely predict that is dreaming. And when you read through the case and you see the the you know three conspiracies that are alleged in that indictment, do they seem unusual to you or unexpected or or sort of what you would have expected from from the special prosecutor? I think the most notable initial reaction based upon just the charges themselves is that they did not travel down the road of insurrection, which I think was the invitation that was out there both by the committee in, in Congress. Uh, I think there was a, a public perception and expectation that that would be the, the road that the special counsel would, would travel, and that didn't happen. So that, that was my first reaction. The, the, the charges that were actually brought, I don't think are hugely surprising, um, but it was a significant walk away, at least in my judgment, from what had been uh, contemplated um, and I think, I mean, I don't know, I haven't spoken to members of the committee directly, but I think that was, I think that was the invitation, frankly, that the committee gave to um, a referral uh, for prosecutors to determine whether or not to bring charges. And the, the timing of it, this, the, the indictment comes as he's a candidate for president, you know, before he's secured the nomination. I mean, it, it really is an unprecedented moment. This confluence of politics and, and criminal law I mean, what do you make of that? Well, that's an unavoidable collision with the political process. Um, I mean, you know, at this point, it's not really appropriate for me to talk any longer about whether or not I think this was a wise exercise of prosecutorial discretion, which I don't. I, I think the country is going to rue the, uh, the day that we travel down this road. But, you know, from the perspective of where we go from here, th that's not a useful conversation any longer. I mean, the only way to tame the poor exercise of prosecutorial discretion is for Donald Trump's lawyers and for a jury, ultimately, uh, if not a judge, to decide that, um, you know, the case doesn't have merit. Uh, th that's ultimately the only way that prosecutors um, are uh, given the brushback pitch, so to speak, uh, meaning that um, if, if there's a judgment made about whether there was uh, untoward exercise of prosecutorial discretion, uh, it's up to either a judge or a jury uh, to make that determination. I mean, there's nothing you can do at this point now that the prosecutor has brought charges if you're Donald Trump and his lawyers other than beat them. But you did think it wasn't a proper use of prosecutorial discretion. Why? Well, I think it lands us right in the middle of uh, a presidential campaign. It, it is unavoidably going to be tainted um, with uh, the appearance of uh, politics at play. Um, obviously, that's the card that, that Donald Trump will, will, will play. I, I understand that there are people in this country who have mixed views about whether or not um, that should be or shouldn't be. And there's obviously a huge public sentiment in the view that no person should be above the law, and it shouldn't necessarily matter um, that there's interference with the political process. You know, 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump, I think, might well differ with that. He's likely to be the nominee of his party, and he's going to find himself, at least as currently scheduled, with trials that uh, could well take place before the election. I have my doubts about that as well. We can talk about some of the reasons why, in connection with this case, that the current trial date is not likely to hold. But in any event, I mean, it's a rather extraordinary thing when you think about it, uh, to be the, in the middle of a campaign season, um, to be you know, in or around Super Tuesday, uh, of, of 2024, and you're going to have a major presidential candidate who's expected to be and will be required to be in court facing trial 
for the better part of, you know, give your best estimate of what, how long this trial will take, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, um, that interferes with the political process. Um, there are those in this country that don't think that's a problem. Um, there are those in this country, I think, probably evenly divided, who do think that's a major problem and that, uh, it, that it necessarily interferes with um, the exercise of the right to vote for the candidate of your choice if the candidate of your choice is in the dock facing trial on, on felony charges in the middle of a, of a campaign cycle. The point that you're making there is not about whether the, it's a good case or not, because the, the rule of law people, as you say, would say, oh, uh, you know, if he sees a crime, you know, he should charge it no matter what the calendar is, no matter what the political, but, but you think that, that there are other considerations than whether Jack Smith concludes, I think there was a crime here. Right. And I mean, that's the, the exercise of, of prosecutorial discretion. I mean, should this case have been brought um, in 2023, knowing that that's exactly what was going to happen and you were going to dump not only this case, but the other the three cases right in the, in the middle of a, an election cycle? Um, you know, there are obviously countervailing arguments, including statute of limitations and other things. And I think everybody seems to understand the possibility, at least, that if Donald Trump is elected president, this case goes away. I mean, he has the authority, if he's the new president, to direct the attorney general of the United States to dismiss the charges at, at whatever stage the case is at that point. It may be pending sentencing. It may not have yet gone to trial. It may be on appeal. Um, but I think there's one thing I can guarantee for sure. There's not too many things I can guarantee for sure. But one of the things I can guarantee for sure is that this case, in, in whatever form it's in, will not be final by November of 2024. That much I am sure of. And if that's so, and if that's so, what that means is that uh, if he is the new president um, and has been elected, he can dispose of it. And that, I mean, my view of that is that, you know, people always ask the question, well, are you saying that he can pardon himself? It doesn't require that he pardon himself. He has the full uh, power un under the Constitution with all the executive power um, to dismiss the charges. And there's not anything anybody can do about it. No judge can do anything about that. That's the end of it. He just pulls the plug on the charges. I mean, in a way, you're saying that, that the final say is not going to be the jury or the judge. It's going to be the American people in the, in the election, assuming he gets the nomination. Well, that's the way I would like to view it. I, I understand also that you know that's there's not a unanimous uh, view on that. I, I tend to rely on where you go to sort of first principles. Abraham Lincoln, uh, patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people that resides with the voters. Um, that that's where I think this belongs. I mean, if he's no longer the president and he's not a candidate for office and this is over, have at it, prosecute him. You know. Uh, that, that's what we mean by, you know, no person is above the law. But, you know, for example, right now, the former president has a motion pending before the, uh, the district court in the District of Columbia claiming um, that he is uh, immune from criminal process with regard to these charges which involve his official acts as president of the United States. There's case law from the Nixon era that say that this extends to the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities. I, I mean, it seems to me that's a pretty substantial motion. It may not have merit in the view of the government uh, and also, you know, more importantly, the judge, but that immunity defense, I can tell you, is one of those very few and rare issues like double jeopardy that is an appealable order even while a case is ongoing, meaning before it is concluded. I mean, in the criminal uh, process, generally speaking, defendants don't have appellate rights until there's a conviction and a sentencing, and the case then goes up on appeal to challenge all possible errors that occurred from the indictment on forward. Um, immunity and double jeopardy and those kinds of defenses where the defendant would actually suffer uh, harm if there wasn't an appeal since the whole point of immunity is that you're not subject to indictment, prosecution, and trial. That is an issue that will necessarily, no matter what the outcome, will, will be um, appealed to the um, United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And it won't end there. It's likely also, whatever the decision in that court, um, that a petition for certiorari will be filed 
Um, again, even if the president loses, my guess is that he will uh, file a petition. And that is going to take time. So I guess that what was my, sort of my back-ended way of saying, if anybody thinks this case is actually going to go on the current trial schedule, I think that's unrealistic to think that's the case. Now, is it possible that all those proceedings could be expedited and make their way through the district court to the Court of Appeals to the United States Supreme Court and, the, and allow for a trial prior to November of 2024? That's certainly possible. But I, I don't think that the current trial date is likely to hold for that reason. And what did you think of the committee? I mean, obviously, it didn't have members appointed by Kevin McCarthy, and it has unusual hearings. It uses video testimony for the first time as prime time, hearing from some of the top Trump officials, you know, Bill Barr, senior campaign advisors. When you watched the, the hearing or, or, or read about it, what was the reaction you had to how it was run to, to what they were doing? Obviously, it was not, I, I don't think really by any large stretch can you characterize it as bipartisan. So it, it strikes me, and this is, I guess, a consequence of, of bigger issues about the evenly divided country that we're in and extreme partisanship and, you know, all the rest in the political process. I, I think the, the wonder and the genius of what happened during the Watergate era is that the, the reason that Richard Nixon ultimately left office and face prosecution is because it was a bipartisan effort um, to, to essentially uh, showcase for him and the American people um, that, uh, that, that they had had enough and that the, the conduct wasn't going to be tolerated and that there was a political judgment made, but that political judgment, in addition to the legal judgments, was one that was, you know, in, in the best sense, bipartisan and with regard to the prosecutorial judgments that, that were made, nonpartisan. I think we've reached a point in this country where we seem to think that every problem out there is one that a federal prosecutor or a state and local prosecutor uh, should resolve with criminal charges. I don't happen to be one of them. Um, and I think that you know, if, you're, if you pin your hopes on, on that, I, I think you're going to be at the end of this process sorely disappointed. But having said that, you know, we are where we are. They were duly constituted. Um, I, I don't particularly think that it was a, a special effort on anybody's part uh, to make it bipartisan, which would have lended itself to more public credibility. But, you know, that's what happened. I guess that's the environment that we're in. And I guess, you know, those on the other side would say, well, yeah, but that's the best that we could do. So, you know, get over it, live with it. Okay, get over it, you know, live with it. But that doesn't change the fact that I think at the outset, it undermines, I think, bipartisan um, you know, universal accept acceptance uh, of their judgments. And then once a referral is made, you know, I think that's viewed in the political context as being a political act, unavoidably based upon how the, um, the special committee was constituted. Let me ask you one last question about the January 6th committee, which is maybe as a, as a lawyer, as somebody who's had to make arguments for a jury, I mean, when you watch it, the power of seeing, you know, Bill Barr, um, come up on video and the way they use video clips, the way they use testimony. What did you think of the, the case that they were making and the way that they were making the case? Well, I, I think, I think um, first of all, uh, yes, that is testimony under oath. But understand, I think importantly, and it's important for Americans to remember this, you know, none of that testimony was given under cross-examination. So you're getting a one-sided view um, from the perspective of political actors in the political process asking questions and having a witness respond under oath. I think you should assume, therefore, that that testimony may not look exactly the same when it is under oath in a criminal case um, without the cameras in the courtroom under cross-examination of President Trump's lawyers. That, that will have a very different look and feel about it. I don't know, you know, in terms of an evaluation of that evidence by a jury, how that will be different. But it, like the point is, it will be different. Then that's maybe a good segue then into talking about some of these points, because that's what we don't have, right? We have what the, the committee presented. We have what the indictment is. We don't know yet what the, the defense will present, you know, for some of these moments, for some of these. Right these pieces of evidence. It'll be both the president's defense 
if he chooses to put one on, he obviously under the Constitution doesn't have to advance a, a defense and he doesn't have to take the stand in his own defense if he doesn't want to. Um, but, you know, part of the defense also not just is the defense case to the extent he presents one, but the defense case is also in, in the course of every criminal trial, not, you know, most people don't see these things. But you present a case by, by virtue of, of, of your cross-examination, the defense cross-examination of the government's witnesses. So let's just take some of these moments of evidence that, that are, end up in the indictment and, and are in the January 6th committee. I mean, they start the story. They say, you know, election night, Trump had been told by his senior advisors that it was too early to claim, you know, victory. Um, there hasn't yet been clear evidence. You know, there's not the specific allegations of, of, of fraud at that point. Rudy Giuliani is, you know, allegedly uh, by some of the accounts is, is intoxicated, is encouraging him to to declare victory. And and the case that they're making is, well, this shows this goes to a state of mind. This shows that that everything that followed later was was the president sort of manipulating this, falsely claiming that he'd won the election because he was claiming he won the election even before he had had the evidence of it. I mean, how do you evaluate a moment like that as a piece of evidence in the, in the case against the former president? Context. Al Gore thought he won the election too. So what? I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I, my, my reaction to that is I, I'm wondering, I, I understand it makes a, now, a nice sound bite and to have you know videotape uh, a presentation with regard to any and all of that, and the evidence about you know Rudy Giuliani's intoxication and all the stuff that I guess you know people love to chase down. My first reaction to that is okay. So a candidate thought he won the election. What else is new? Uh, you know, I I just I I, I don't find I, I, you got to be careful about trying to you know turn that into. Um, criminal intent and understand what flies for persuasive testimony before a congressional uh, committee uh, without the benefit of cross-examination and without the requirement that a jury, after all, this is the thing I, you, know, you have to keep coming back to, in terms of resolution of criminal charges against the defendant in which he is subjected to the possible penalty of going to prison, our system requires that a jury of 12 unanimously meaning all of them, all 12 of them, find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So if the evidence doesn't stack up to a, a finding that the president did something with regard to intent about um, the election results, uh, th that is an element of the offense that a jury can actually find persuasively, unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, then it's really not worth a whole lot. Again, you know, as, as juries are instructed all the time, it's nice that the, the indictment contains all of these allegations. That's what they are, ladies and gentlemen. They're allegations on a piece of paper. They're not worth, you know, jack doo doo, okay? They're not worth anything until you, unless and until you decide that they're sufficient beyond a reasonable doubt to prove all of the elements of, of the charge that the government has brought. So, you know, that, when I see, when I hear that, that's sort of, the mode that I'm thinking, both as a, a former prosecutor and also as a, as a defense lawyer at, at, at a criminal trial. I mean, and aside from the constitutional issues, on, on the criminal law issues, I mean, is this the hardest thing for the prosecutors to prove to win over a jury on, which is the state of mind of the intent of the president for these actions? Yes. Um, as I think anybody will tell you, in, in white collar cases, you know, unlike other cases, drug cases and some other things where, you know, intent is almost in some sense, once you prove the acts, it's almost self-evident. In every case like, like, the, like this one, um, in these areas, um, intent is the, is the whole ballgame. The jury is making an evaluation of that. Um, that's the most difficult thing to prove, not impossible, but it is the most difficult thing to prove. So as the case goes on, um, well, you know, the indictment, the January 6th, I mean, what they say is, is after Election Day, um, very senior campaign officials tell the president who he, these are people who he chose, that they can't find the fraud, that they can't find, you know, the allegations, that there's nothing there. He is hearing from Rudy Giuliani and some others claims. And, and you know, the way it's portrayed is, is there's one, um, Bill Barr, you know, refers to the clown car uh, group 
and, and and then there's the other group which is called Team Normal. And that part of where the conspiracy really starts is is an intentional decision to reject the advice of of the more sober group of his advisors. I mean, when you look at a moment like that, how do you evaluate that evidence? I think part of me always thinks that you you're not any better able um, to prove that there was no fraud in the election as I am able to prove there was fraud in the election. Um, and, and if a president came back in response to however many advisors came forward to say, we haven't found it, you know, what, what would be so, I don't know what the evidence will be at trial, but suppose the president's reaction was, well, you haven't looked hard enough. Um, you say you haven't found any, um, but, you know, I mean, one of the difficulties about election, I guess is somewhat of a side issue, but election cases are always very difficult. The, the difficulties are the election takes place in November and all of these activities are, are a lead up to when everybody seems to understand there's sort of the point of no return when the election results are certified in the, in the Congress in, in January. Um, you know, that doesn't leave a whole lot of time, right? You're talking about two months. Um, you know, d finding evidence uh, of fraud is not such a, a, a simple thing. And then, of course, the, the, you have the added texture that you have to find evidence that would be sufficient to change the outcome of the election. Um, you know, I think most people, lawyer, election lawyers, know it's one thing to talk about a handful of votes, maybe, you know, something less than um, a few hundred. It's another thing to start, you know, talking about changing um, and, and, and determining that the result of the election would change as a result of finding fraud that would be thousands of votes. So, um, you know, I think there's all, there's all of those elements uh, you know, in that. But remember, President Trump's also a candidate. And it it's not, would be not unsurprising for a candidate to have a reaction about, look, this is very, very close. Uh, I don't believe that these results are, are accurate. And I'm determined to find proof that I'm right. And, you know, I, I, I guess the question is, how far can you, this is what I think a jury is going to have to evaluate as a matter of intent. How far can you go in that? Um, I understand, you know, maybe a jury will be able to easily dismiss certain people who are giving the president advice that the jury determines are not credible and that, you know, President Trump should have dismissed them. But, you know, again, it will be a reflection on the jury to take a reflection on Donald Trump's intent about you know, what, was it appropriate? And, and allowing for, look, in a criminal case, that a defendant could still be wrong and could still be mistaken um, and could even be exercising a serious error in judgment without actually falling into the trap of being criminally uh, liable and responsible for that conduct. I mean, I, I understand those are all sort of gradations of degree, um, and I think those are very hard calls. And I think, you know, what you're going to see is I think those kinds of issues will be explored uh, in a different context at a criminal trial through cross-examination that you have not yet seen before with regard to the experience of going through uh, the January 6th committee. I mean, is it enough for him to, to believe it in his heart of hearts? I mean, because just to give another example, Bill Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, has had the FBI, has talked to U.S. attorneys. He has the entire apparatus of the DOJ. He's announced he's going to investigate these claims. He comes to the president. He says, we have looked into them. The FBI has looked into them. I have talked to the U.S. attorneys. You know, there was not substantial fraud that would that would have changed the outcome of the election. On the other side, he has, he has Sidney Powell, who I gather he has, uh, you know, some testimony said he feels is like out there. It might, might be a little bit, bit crazy. I mean, if he believes, if he if he really believes her, because he doesn't want to admit that he won, and whether that's a cycle, I mean, is that enough of a defense? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think so in the extreme, but I think to put it turn it around another way, I don't think I think the president would be well within his prerogative if the attorney general says I don't find anything, and the answer is no. I don't think the president has to accept that. Like, just with regard to anything else that the president receives. The Secretary of Defense says, you know, we should attack. That doesn't mean that the President of the United States, who ultimately is responsible for making that call, goes out and attacks. 
he, he receives advice from all different quarters. Some of that advice is awful. Some of that advice is good. There's a mixture of things. Uh, all, you get all kinds of advice. You know, part of, the, of being in the job is being able to separate out the advice that's nonsense from the advice that you actually have to listen to. But ultimately, it's, it's the president's call. Again, this is why we're in sort of a you know, never, never land here. Um, this is not your ordinary criminal defendant, right? Your ordinary criminal defendant's not the president of the United States entrusted with all of this executive power to make judgments about what he thinks is an appropriate course of action. Um, we only entrust two people in the country um, but through an election uh, with that kind of power, the president or, you know, as an alternative, the vice president, should the president become incapacitated or, um, you know, for whatever reason can't serve in office. Those are the only two people in our system that are elected by all the people of the United States. Nobody else. That's it. So, you know, you, when you put a president on trial, um, it, it's going to come with all of those things built into the equation. He doesn't have to agree with the attorney general. Maybe a lot of other people in the United States are bound by what the attorney general says. The president is not. But is there a limit to the reasonable? I think that's the right question. And I don't have a clear answer for that. I, and I don't know the answer to that. I do think that there is a limit to that. I, I don't know how far that extends. I think that's gonna be a very difficult question for the jury to struggle with and I think it, even in the first instance, I think that's going to be a very difficult question for the district judge to struggle with in jury instructions that are given to the jury to help them evaluate how to deal with that, just what you're talking about, just that kind of evidence. I think there's got to be room, my own view, the American people will make their own judgment about whether I'm right or wrong about this. I think there has to be a pretty wide berth for the president to have the ability to be wrong, but it is not unlimited. And where exactly that line falls, I, I don't really know. I don't think anybody really knows. We've never traveled this road before. But the bar might be higher than it would be, say, a CEO in a white collar case where where an expert had told him something and, and he says, well, I don't believe you know smoking is harmful or whatever. You think that the president is due more uh, leeway. And I understand the counter argument. The first thing someone's going to say in response to that, well, what you're saying then, Mr. Ray, is that the president is above the law. No, that's not what I'm saying. The president's not above the law, but the unique aspects of his office and the powers that he commands on consent and the will of the American people count for something. And it means that you treat presidents differently than you would treat anybody else. And if people say, well, that's not right and that's not fair and that's not consistent with the rule of law and that's not consistent with the principle that no person is above the law, I guess my response is, I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, get over it. OK, that's just life. That's the way it is. That's our system. The president has enormous power. Get over it. OK, and he's got to be able, consistent with the duties of his office, to be able to to operate, generally speaking, without a whole lot of constraints. Now, he is constrained like we all are by the law, but the law is applied to him. You know, it, 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 it can't be so onerous that the president's response to his attorney general or somebody providing him advice, like, like, no, Mr. President, there's no fraud. It can't be, well, geez, I guess I must have to accept that at face value and just stand down. That, that can't be the answer. Now, as to how far that extends out, I grant you that it is not unlimited. You know, how far that goes, I think, is something, again, for a judge in the first instance through jury instructions and a jury to decide. I mean, and is it clear? All of this, you mentioned that the, what they, the defense has filed. Is it clear that all of this is somehow part of the president's job or that, that he's due that deference as, as the president when, you know, the prosecutor is saying he, this is outside of his, I assume they're going to say, this is outside of his realm as president. He's trying to overturn an election and that's not part of the oath. Well, I think they're going to try to make it, you know, entirely personal. President Trump is acting the way he's acting, not really as a as a president of the United States, but entirely as Donald Trump, the person who is after the prize, which is re-election, and will do anything, legal or illegal, in order to obtain it. And I think you know, a fair approach to this, and I imagine one that the defense will present, is take Donald Trump out of this. Suppose that there was a disputed election, and suppose it was a member of his own party. 
I mean, you know, whether Mike Pence or somebody else who was running for president, and it was a disputed election, and Donald Trump's the president of the United States, you don't think he would have the authority and the discretion to wade into the election results, to challenge them where he thought appropriate, even if it was to the benefit of his candidate, but not him, not, not Donald Trump himself. You know, the president has those powers. So how are you gonna separate out that those the the the, the, the perquisites of uh, of the president as president, you know, as opposed to the president as Donald Trump, the candidate for office for president, and I think those are going to be things you have to tease out. I, I don't think it's true, as the as the government way, may well present that this is just about Donald Trump as Donald Trump, the individual, not the president, who is 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 trying to capture the office of of president of the United States through illegal means. The president has authority, and he would have that authority even if he weren't the person who was the candidate to investigate and to look into election results. Even if they, you know, even if there's a self-interest there, meaning that the, the candidate of his choice is the one of the candidates, just not him. So one other issue, right? So the beginning of this conspiracy, as the government alleges it, is actually who he's choosing as a lawyer, right? Is to to choose Rudy Giuliani who is a co-conspirator, according to, to the indictment, who is a, a co-defendant in the Georgia case. For the president, and there's a number of lawyers who are involved in this uh, along the way, for part of the criminal case to be this decision, to uh, choose these lawyers, to have them part of, of the case as, as listed as co-conspirators. How do you analyze that as part of this the, the case against the president, that, that he took these lawyers, he used them as part of a criminal conspiracy that, that he's leading, as I think basically what the allegation is. I suppose my first reaction, well, is it is it any surprise that the president would choose lawyers that um, are, are consistent with his view of things? I, I, mean, I, I mean, people make decisions about lawyers all the time. It's not surprising that um, the views of the lawyers often adopt the views of the client, not always. And, you know, lawyers have independent obligations to, uh, to to play it straight and obviously not do anything that's, you know, contrary to the code of professional conduct and um, the constraints of, uh, of the criminal law, just like any other American. Um, but on the other hand, you know, what, 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 what is um, a reality of, of the case that has been brought, not necessarily by Jack Smith, but you know Rudy Giuliani is a is a defendant in another criminal case. So um, the the fact is that um, you know absent some kind of a decision to grant Rudy Giuliani immunity, you're not likely to hear from Rudy Giuliani as a witness at trial. Uh, to defend either himself or to defend the president's conduct because he's likely to take the Fifth Amendment and the government is not likely to grant him immunity, which means that he is essentially precluded from being a witness. So you're not going to hear from him. And I think the same is true with regard to Sidney Powell, right? You know, if called as a witness, what, sh what would she do? She'd have to take the Fifth Amendment. Absent a grant of immunity by the government, and only the government can grant immunity, She's not going to be a witness at trial because of, of, of the Fifth Amendment. The jury is never going to, of course, know anything about any of that. Those witnesses will simply not be part of the government's case. The statements the, pres the former president has made since, you know, he went on to meet the press in September and was asked about this specific thing, like, why did you choose these lawyers over others? And he's pushed sort of in a back and forth. And he says, you know, basically, I made up my mind, you know, on election night. And if you weren't with me, you know, you were a, a rhino or you were not somebody that, that was to be trusted. I mean, are those those statements from from him since going to be damaging? I think they might uh, be uh, admissible. The government may choose to offer them. I, I, I think that's a decidedly dicey proposition. I, I, again, I you know, the president making a self-interested decision to choose certain lawyers. I mean, everybody picks in an administration <laughs> is is an exercise of a political judgment and and in and the president's self-interest. I, I don't. I mean, I I just think that's a extraordinarily naive view about things to think that that's going to be evidence of criminal intent. I mean, look, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just, I don't find that to be overly persuasive. I think you're going to have to prove, you know, on the merits that no reasonable person, given these sets of choices, 
would have accepted that advice even if it was offered as legal advice. And I think that's an uphill climb. I mean, I think that's a difficult thing for the government to have to face. I don't think that's a controversial view on my part. It, and again, I'm not saying it can't be done and it's not something that the government can overcome. I just think it's difficult. And so the, the formal advice of counsel defense that says that Giuliani, Eastman, whoever else was telling him that these things were legal, um, do you think that that could be a successful defense for uh, for the former president, or is it a difficult one if they can't testify and they're not going to testify? I have just sort of thought through that. I think that's, yeah, I mean, I think you that's the issue that we're sort of pressing here is exactly how would he present that defa defense? You know, in some sense, the 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 government has already had an impact in that regard by charging or naming or characterizing these lawyers as either indicted or unindicted co-conspirators. Um, I, I don't imagine there could be a circumstance where any of those lawyers, you know, with the, with, their, with the benefit of their own counsel, would voluntarily take the stand and testify as a witness either for the defense or prosecution, knowing what the potential ramifications could be. I mean, I think anybody in that circumstance would be well advised to take the Fifth Amendment and would follow that advice. And that essentially takes those witnesses off the table. I mean, defendants have argued in any number of cases that that grants an unfair advantage uh, for, to the government because it can be seen as a tactical decision. And I'm sure that, you know, that was something that the, the, the prosecutors thought about. But yeah, under those circumstances, I think it makes it difficult for the, the president to present a, an advice of uh, counsel defense, at least in the usual sense. One of the things that's very powerful, if you read the January 6th report, is they have a table and they say, this is what the president was told, this is what he said publicly. And they go through all of the experts who say one thing and then the president says um, says something else. And it appears on its face to be a pretty powerful piece of evidence that he was told and that that he believed something else. I mean, maybe this is a question I asked you before, but, but I mean, is there... If it was another defendant and they might be able to say he lived in his own reality, this is something you hear about um, the former president... Trump, that he's he's almost divorced from reality, but he's also the president of the United States. I mean, can they make that argument that, you know, he was living in his own reality inside his own mind? You can make that argument, but if you do make that argument, that comes with some risk, too, to the defense. And that is it invites uh, and the court would likely give a conscious avoidance instruction, otherwise known as sort of a response to the ostrich defense. Well, I don't, I didn't accept any of that, and I chose basically to stick my head in the sand, and therefore the, the government, you can't prove that I had criminal intent. And the instruction that would be given, conscious avoidance, is that it, it is not a defense for the defendant to essentially uh, consciously avoid knowing or having uh, criminal knowledge by essentially shutting out all information that comes in and disregarding it. Um, you know, ultimately, it's for you to the jury to decide if, the, if a defendant did that, that that could be itself evidence of criminal intent. And so that's why I say it comes with some risk. If the, if the defense travels down that road, it is going to be met and, and, and likely uh, will uh, result in uh, the district court giving a conscious avoidance instruction to the jury, which again is a, what, what people in the trade refer to as an intent uh, to avoid the intent defeater. Um, you know, you can't stick your head in the sand and, and avoid ever having criminal intent if you do that that itself is evidence of the fact that you were avoiding what you knew to be the result, which was uh, a criminal intent. In other words, it's the same thing. And that instruction is a very pro-government and very damaging um, to a defense instruction. But if, 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 if the president's lawyers travel down that road and invite such a uh, consideration of, of, of such a defense, it will be met with an instruction that will counter it, and that's the instruction the district court would likely give. And it's a pretty, I have seen it in practice on, on both sides. It's a pretty powerful instruction. Yeah, I mean, and all of these defenses have to be weighed in the fact they're happening in election year too, you know? Yes. So you, you, it's hard to say the president is, you know, disconnected right. from reality. Right, right. And, you know, all those things, again, all of that's fair game. All the president's statements are, are, are fair game. Wh which ones the, the prosecution decides to introduce, um, you know, those are big tactical uh, decisions. And, and then how uh, the, the defense reacts to that and what, if any, evidence they put on uh, to counteract that. Um, you know, each move and each counter move 
uh, has a certain effect in a trial, and it, it also comes with, with, with various risks, some of which, you know, you make decisions not to step into certain things because if you know you do, uh, just like we discussed in the conscious avoidance area, you, you know, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. You travel down that road, you're gonna get this instruction. So those are the kinds of th things that will play out in a trial. The First Amendment, the indictment goes out of its way to say, the you know former president has rights under the First Amendment can go to the courts can claim you know can can say whatever they want uh, whatever he wants but then says in the indictment the defendants knowingly false statements were integral to his criminal plans to defeat the government function to obstruct the certification you know how how strong is the argument for the defense huge you know, it's not not a crime to lie well I I think it's huge for the this is a this is a central area of the president's defense. He does have First Amendment rights, and particularly as president, and trying to turn words into criminal conduct is a very slippery road for the prosecution under the First Amendment. And in the event of a conviction, I can guarantee you this, this will be point one in the brief on appeal. Um, th this is a major issue, um, and it is in um, as, as the judge that I used to clerk for was fond of saying, the First Amendment is the First Amendment for a reason. That's why it's first. Okay, um, th this one's a big one, uh, and I think you should you know watch for that. I think it it should be big for a jury. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the district court navigates around that through jury instructions about sort of what crosses over the line into criminal conduct. My reaction when I read it in the indictment was, okay, that's nice. That's a little too clever by half. This is a, you know, this is a, a, a major issue. They have tried to draft around it, understanding that it is going to be a major defense. And it's both a major defense at trial, but even more importantly, it's a major defense on appeal. Even in the event of a conviction, this is one area where an appellate court could toss a conviction, notwithstanding the fact that a jury found him guilty. And that's a separate defense from the from whether you can prove intent or not. Correct. Even if you could prove intent, there is a zone under the First Amendment um, that you know cr criminal uh, authority cannot enter. And you know we have the exceptions about you know you can't scream fire in a theater, um, but you know the question is, given what the president said. Uh, and again, it was a rather, remember, it was a rather one-sided approach. Significantly, the committee, of course, played videotape about what the president was encouraging people to do and then left out the piece that said, now, I, you know, I want you to go to the Hill and be peaceful. You know, they didn't find that to be particularly uh, persuasive and didn't think that th those words really amounted in their judgment as, as, as a defeat to what it is he, the president was asking or inviting people to do. But I can tell you what, that, that will certainly be something that the defense will feature prominently at, at trial. And even, again, even in the event of um, jury instructions that you know, go to the jury and a jury finds that they, they can find an intent beyond a reasonable doubt, that still may run up against um, the First Amendment and is an issue that I think will be, uh, I, my, I imagine that one will be litigated for some time on appeal. Again, uncharted territory. One of the parts of the conspiracy, the alleged conspiracy, is pressure on local officials. Somebody like Rusty Bowers, the Speaker of Arizona, gets a phone call from the president, from Rudy Giuliani, and they say, we want you to convene a committee to justify, you know, as Bowers tells the story, to justify convening the legislature to send its own electors or to invalidate the electors that were, um, uh, that were in the process of being sent um, from Arizona. And and they say this is a, this is part of the conspiracy to obstruct the results of the election to deny the votes of of you know of voters the rights of voters. Um, how do you analyze a moment like that? It, I think this one's hard for me. Yeah, I, I I find this one difficult. I've thought a great amount about this, and I've also thought about it in the context of my own experience. You know, when a president asks something, or somebody within the you know cloaked in the powers of the of the administration. I mean, I was, I was thinking about this in connection with the FBI files investigation and the travel office that in part involved conduct by Hillary Clinton on behalf of the administration to ask certain people to do things. 
without a, a direction to actually do them. When a president or with cloaked with the authority of the president asks, it, it's not like what any other American citizen, you know, can do. There's an enormous amount of power behind that. And getting into the question of when somebody asks you to do something, is that an order? How is that received? Should, should you know, Hillary Clinton or anybody else be criminally accountable for how somebody receives that different than, you know, anybody else? I struggled greatly with those questions in connection with the Whitewater investigation. And in this context, you know, obviously a little different, um, I, you know, I don't know where that lands exactly. On the one hand, I guess I take great comfort in the fact that all of these officials, elected or appointed or otherwise, take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. If the president asks you to do something, it's not asking you necessarily and shouldn't be viewed necessarily as an invitation to violate your oath to do something that you shouldn't be doing. And I think about that in this context as well as the context of President Trump asking Mike Pence to do something. You know, it wasn't an order to do something. It was, you know, this is what I want you to do. Or, you know, if, and if you don't do it, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're really not, you're not, you're a rhino and you're not, you're not being loyal to this administration. Uh, can that, in that context, with regard to a president, can that be deemed to be evidence of a criminal conspiracy and, and, and of criminal intent? I'm not so sure about that. You know, I, I think the, the, the ask doesn't necessarily assume that what you're, that, that uh, assume the result. You're asking. It's almost implicit, just like the government wants you to assume that in that ask, you're asking somebody to engage in criminal conduct. You know, I, I, I think there's a fair argument to be made, and I am assuming you're going to see it or hear about it at trial. I'm making an ask of you, and I'm asking you, consistent with your oath in the office that, you, that you're in, whether you can see your way to find 13,000 votes. That, I, I don't consider that, that statement um, alone, and I understand the government's going to tr try to provide context, but that statement alone, to me, is not sufficient to prove uh, guilty knowledge or guilty intent beyond a reasonable doubt. It just isn't. And I guess one of the questions is, is who interprets what the oath is. I mean, Rusty Bauer says, literally says, according to his testimony, you are asking me to violate my oath and I will not do that. And they right. go back to him repeatedly, you know, after that point. Right. And But, you know, ultimately, who's the guardian of, of the oath? It's the person who is on the receiving end of that, um, you know, of that uh, invitation. It's not a, a direction. It's not a... You know, I guess you can consider it maybe a command because it comes with the, the power and authority of the president of the United States. But ultimately, we're all constitutional actors, at least those who are appointed uh, or elected to office. And the only person who can keep their oath is the person who takes the oath. Um, I, I don't know that, again, asking somebody um, to violate their oath is really going to be uh, equivalent to without more. And I'm not saying that they can't attempt to show more, but I think in context, if, if that's all you have, I don't find that to be sufficient. I mean, I've seen this defense suggested for the former president that, that you're as a citizen, you're allowed to petition your government and that's what he's doing. But there's also this other defense, which is he's the president of the United States. And, and if he believes he's, you know, securing the election, that that's part of his job. I mean, do right. they have to choose between those? Those two, you know, is he a private petitioner or is he the president of the United States calling Rusty Bowers? Well, I, I think this is difficult for the prosecution because I, I think, you know, the prosecution doesn't have to exclude every potential wild hypothesis of, of innocence and will even get an instruction to that effect. But on the other hand, you know, the prosecution just can't present itself as this is Donald Trump exclusively acting in Donald Trump's interests. I mean, I know there's a sort of a great public sentiment behind in, in, in the public domain now uh, uh, that, you know, everything that Donald Trump does is all about Donald Trump. And I think that's what you're going to likely hear from the government's presentation of this evidence. But, you know, as I said, or suggested to you earlier, 
Um, think about this in the context of it's not Donald Trump. Suppose it were another candidate for the presidency. Donald Trump, for example, had served two terms and he's still the president and there's another candidate for office and it's a close election and the president has power and authority to go into Georgia and, and question the results. You don't think he has the power to do that? Of course he has the power to do that. Absolutely. Now, he can't engage in criminal conduct, but to suggest that he doesn't have the power to inquire and press and press pretty hard, again, I think is, is a ridiculous notion. Of course he has that power. In Giuliani's um, alleged statement to Bowers, we've got lots of theories. We just don't have any evidence. The president is not on the phone call at that point, but Giuliani is considered a co-conspirator. Can that be used against uh, the president? Sure. I mean, statements of, of, of co-conspirators and furtherance of the conspiracy um, are an exception to the hearsay rule. It doesn't require that, um, you know, Rudy Giuliani be there and subject to, to cross-examination. Those, those statements, um, um, you know, can come in in the government's case as an exception to the hearsay rule, and they will be offered as such. And there's a prima facie showing that typically has to be made that the government has presented evidence from which a jury could rationally conclude that a conspiracy existed, existed and that those statements were made in furtherance of the conspiracy. So yes, that, I mean, that's the drill. That's why, you know, conspiracy charges are considered, you know, within the, uh, the, 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 the prosecutor's, uh, what's the phrase? Um, um, it... it I, I can't remember what the phrase is, but it, it's meant to suggest that prosecutors choose a, a conspiracy charges for precisely that reason. It allows them to get into evidence a lot of other a lot of evidence that would otherwise be excluded. In November, in December, because like somebody like Rusty Bowers, you know, after after he's identified in tweets from the president, people show up at his house, militia people there with guns, there's specific threats. Um, at that same time, in December 1st, Gabriel Sterling in Georgia has a press conference that sort of goes viral where, where he says, you know, Mr. President, you've got to stop the lies. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get killed. And the, the president retweets a, that clip of video um, to say Georgia's elections or, or a scam. I mean, is, how... Is it possible to use something like that to say he's on notice for the fact that his words can can cause violence, that that he's on notice for, you know, what his supporters might do? Sure. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, again, if evaluated in context, there's all kinds of things that a president says, given the fact that it what he says and, and, and what he does is captured and transmitted all over the country. The president's not accountable for you know, every single thing that, 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 that happens that, and is as a consequence of what it is he says. It's not like you know, any other you know, ordinary situation or ordinary American. Um, so I guess to answer your question is, sure, can that be introduced? How persuasive will it be? I think that's you know, yet to be determined. And how, and how accountable you know, is he for that? I, I, again, I think that also is for, for the same reason yet to be determined. I don't think I don't think it's an open. I guess my point is I don't think it's an open and shut question. I don't think you can just draw a straight line and say, well, you know, looky here, they they told him, and 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 still he, you know, he persisted, and look what happened. Yeah, a lot of these people who he has phone calls with, who he tweets against, threats come in, people show up at their house, you know, uh, uh, other things. Um, it'd be pretty hard to draw a line between what these third parties are doing and, and what the president's saying. Well, right. And I, you know, again, I, I still think there's room. I, I've even said so publicly, you know, with regard to the whatever it was, two and a half or three hour delay, um, you know, with regard to January 6th and the, and the riot and, 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 and the activities that took place at the Capitol. Frankly, I found that that, that delay was, was reprehensible and a, and a serious error in judgment. On, on the president's part. I think you can have all of those criticisms. I mean, Bill Barr went even further to say that it was a betrayal of the president's office, a, a statement I don't happen to agree with, but even assuming that's so, you know, all of those things don't add up to, and that means that the president um, I invited all of that and is criminally accountable for all that, you know, happened thereafter. I, I think that is still a huge leap, and, and I would suggest to you and to your viewers, and should be, a huge leap. You know, presidents and, and, and others should, again, have a wide berth 
uh, to engage in conduct, e even conduct that is reprehensible, um, that, it, that is, um, you know, unfortunate, um, that is possibly even a betrayal of their oath, uh, which again would be subject to impeachment, uh, but is not necessarily, uh, you know, criminal and should uh, result in a, in a prosecution and a conviction uh, that warrants a sentence of imprisonment. I mean, that's what we're talking about. I think people too easily forget about that. Um, we have gotten, we have grown used to in this country, again, for there to be a prosecutorial solution to every problem. And I, I mean, that's a notion that I reject. I don't think that that's consistent with um, the founders or, or the way our constitutional structure is supposed to function. And again, I think if you travel down this road, you're going to be sorely disappointed in the results. That is not how best to hold people accountable. Again, the, the best way to hold people accountable is through the exercise of the right to vote. That's the patient confidence that Lincoln is referring to in the ultimate justice of the people. I think this is unfortunate because it interferes with that accountability and the operation of, 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 of an assessment of responsibility um, in the political process. And I think once we sort of cross over into that, um, you know, land, we're in a brave new world. And I, I'm not sure that's a world we really want to be in. I don't think that this is healthy for the country in the long view. It, it may address the issues in the short term about you know, President Trump and what is to become of him and what's going to happen to him in this election. But I, I overall don't think this is good for the country. I mean, I take your point. I, th I think the other side would say the alleged crime here is is to interfere with that vote, right? Within what, what Abraham Lincoln was saying was, was the ultimate check. And that's why it's so serious. I hear that. And, um, you know, I, I guess... In the, in the broad context, though, I sort of my, my two responses about the best solution to a lot of problems, including the current environment we're in where we can't even elect a Speaker of the House, is if you want to solve a lot of these problems, including election interference and all the rest, the best, and, and, and also from the President's perspective, allegations of fraud, what's the best solution to all those problems? Elect a Congress where it's clear who the majority is, not within four or eight votes. If you don't like... Um, these kinds of activities with regard to individual states and close elections, what's the solution to that? Elect a candidate, you know, not necessarily in a landslide, but at least convincingly enough that it doesn't make any difference. You know, in an election in which there's a clear victor, does it make any difference whether or not there was fraud in Georgia? Answer, no. I mean, that's the fastest I, practical solution to this problem. So you mentioned the Raffensperger phone call. And when we have talked to people, you know, they they point to that as as one of the biggest pieces of evidence because you can hear the president, you can hear him dismiss the evidence that that Raffensperger and his lawyer are offering. Right. Raffensperger says that he yeah, Trump mentions potential criminal charges, which Raffensperger interprets as a threat to him. And of course, there's the famous quote that you you mentioned, the eleven thousand seven hundred and eighty votes. Do you do you find that evidence to be as damning? as some of the people we've, we've talked to? Well, you know, understand that I'm not the arbiter of this and it's ultimately for a, a fair-minded jury to make a call. That I, Look, I can see the argument on both sides. I, I do think that it has been, from the outset, incredibly overstated in my own judgment. You know, take my word for it. You know, don't take my word for it. That's fine. I, I don't find finding votes to be the equivalent of find me votes whether legally or illegally, to be the same thing. I mean, I, I just think it, it, it's one of those statements that you'd make to say, look, you know, this is a close, it's another way of saying this is a close election. There's only 11,000 plus votes that separate us. There's got to be evidence of fraud out there sufficient to, to, to recapture that many number of votes. I will just tell you parenthetically, 11,000 votes, even in a closely contested election, in order to be able to discount, discount that amount, th that number of votes, is very hard to do. What's the best evidence of that? The, the Bush-Gore election in, in 2000. You know, 11,000 votes is, a, is still a lot of votes. You're not gonna be able to disqualify that number of votes out there in order to change the result in an election, even if you could prove fraud. It's, that's just very difficult to imagine, and certainly difficult to imagine that you could do it within the space of two months. 
you know, that you're going to capture that amount of evidence to be able to persuade somebody that they should throw out, you know, close to 12,000 votes, right? So I, I, I think that that's unrealistic. But I, I don't find that statement to be the equivalent of asking somebody to do something illegal. In the statement about, you know, this could be a crime, you guys could be in, in, in trouble here. Well, that, that comes with it sort of an implicit threat, right? But that to me is a, another way of saying, I'm, I'm asking you to press forward and if you don't, there are consequences. And so I'm really laying it on thick. And so, you know, the prosecution's presentation of that is that in effect, Donald Trump was asking this person with the application of, of direct pressure uh, to, to violate their oath. And again, my response to that is, that's why you take an oath. But when the heat turns up, you, you will not violate your oath. That's in fact, um, you know, what Mike Pence faced. Is the fact that Donald Trump asked him to do that, is, is, is that criminal? Um, again, I think you gotta be really careful there. I, I don't think that's something you wanna make criminal, or at least, you know, on, on its own. The, the mere ask to say, you know, I want you to not certify the results. And, you know, Mike Pence's response to that was, well, I got legal advice, I consulted with my lawyers, and I determined that I did not have that authority consistent with the law and my oath to the Constitution of the United States. And that's what he should have done. One of the most confusing, but seems like a central part of it, is, is the alleged conspiracy to organize fraudulent electors. And the indictment says that they have memos that say, you know, these are not just backup electors, that, they're, that they want to use them to go to Congress on January 6th to invalidate um, what the prosecution calls, you know, legitimate electors. Is that scheme a crime? I, again, I, not to put too fine a point on it, the jury's still out on that. You know, I, I don't think there's any, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with having a slate of electors. Um, you know, electors aren't really electors until you have a, a legitimate basis to put them forward. Um, I, I guess that's going to where the rubber meets the road in the prosecution's case. You put a, you know, a slate of electors together and you really didn't have a legitimate basis to put them forward. Therefore, they're, they're sham electors. And I think, um, you know, we have instances in our history where it, in, in close elections, in, in, in particular uh, states, even at the presidential level, where you know, candidates have, uh, have moved forward with, with alternate um, slates, I think including the election in 1960 with uh, John Kennedy and, and Richard Nixon. So, I, I mean, again, I think this is an area where be careful about trying to suggest that that act alone is sufficient to uh, draw a conclusion that that was uh, you know, criminal conduct and criminal mischief. I, I don't really think uh, that should be the case, and I think there's you know, obviously good reason why it, why, it, why it shouldn't be the case. But if they can prove, you know, the internal memos say this is really to, to create a pretext for January 6th, you know, they claim they say that there's evidence that they're misleading those people who are signing those documents. Yeah, I mean, I think that, them that it's only a backup when it's not. That's not what the plan is. The, theoretically, right, if they've got that evidence that every that they all understood that it was a pretext, that there wasn't going to be any way to 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 show uh, fraud sufficient to warrant an alternate slate of elections and that they were just putting this forward in, in order to you know, create an impediment and a roadblock to the certification of, of the election results, yes. Th theoretically, um, you know, that still wouldn't be a bar to being able to prove uh, criminal intent. I I'm just suggesting to you that it is not quite as clean and simple as that. And again, understand, we go back to sort of the original point we, were, we started with. Remember that you know, all this is what the government suggests that it has. What happens when those people actually are called in and are subject to cross-examination? And, you know, and it's going to have to be the kind of testimony where it sort of excludes the possibility you know, uh, with a virtual certainty that there couldn't have been a path through which an alternate sl slate of electors would have been appropriate. And if they can do that, you know, more power to them. That you know, that 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 might well be sufficient, proof sufficient, um, you know, in this area to prove the, the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. But I, I don't, I don't think it's going to be clean or simple. I think that's going to be another one that's difficult. And again, I, the uh, the jury's still out on that one. Well, you know, we'll, yet to be determined. 
mean, another suggested defense has been that you can't make a, a wrong interpretation of the law criminal and that they believe that legislatures can revoke, you know, duly elected electors, that they believe that the Congress can choose whoever they want, no matter how legitimate they may be. I mean, is that really a defense? I think it's a defense to a degree, right? You know, it, I mean, it, it, you know, again, you can imagine in the extreme, if, 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 if essentially it it's can't be viewed as anything other than a pretext, then it's not much of a defense. I, exploring, though, where between it's absolutely a pretext and, wait a minute, it's a disputed election, it's close, provisional um, actions are taken, Yes, it relies on other people to follow their oath and make judgments about whether or not these are legitimate electors or not. But the mere fact of putting it forward and the mere fact that they might have been wrong in making that calculated judgment shouldn't necessarily or inevitably lead to criminal charges. Do I think there's still space in that area? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think there's still space in that area to say we may even have been wrong and we may have even made an error in judgment and we may even have been wrong on the law, but that doesn't mean that we are criminally responsible for, uh, for the result and the mere fact that we placed it and put it forward. I mean, I guess if you're the prosecution, you're saying, too, is, that, is we didn't just put them forward, right? We pressured the vice president to accept them. Right. We did all of these other actions. You know, uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising to think that in, in a hotly contested election that, uh, you know, pressure is applied. We don't think that happened in other elections that were disputed. Um, I mean, of course it did. Maybe, you know, maybe not to the same degree that we've now been able to expose here. But, um, you know, there's a lot riding on this. This is not just any old election. This is the presidency of the United States. And it comes down to a very few s number of states. And it, it's close. Um, you, you, it would not have been surprising to have had an election challenge. It would not be surprising to have had that election challenge continue up to and including uh, January 6, where you know it's the point of no return. Part of the alleged conspiracy, um, the pressure on the Department of Justice that the acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen and the Deputy Acting Attorney General Richard Donahue push back, say, you know, we're not finding the fraud. We're not going to, you know sign this letter from, from Jeffrey Clark, say at, at one point, apparently um, Donnie writes down, the president says to them, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman after he'd been told that, that there was no fraud in the election. Can that be part of the crime that the prosecution can prove? Look, any, anything and everything is, is evidence that can be presented that may well um, be accepted or not by a jury as part of the crime. Um, I look. I think that's a very uh, unfortunate statement on the on the president's part. But you know, it wouldn't be the first time that a president, you know, said something. Take it out of this context and just put it into the context of the president's ordinary responsibilities. I hear what you're saying about you know legal schmiegel, but you know I, this is the course I want to tr take and let the legal stuff catch up to it. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that a president made a, a, a conscious decision to reject advice. Uh, from his legal advisors, including the, his White House counsel or the Department of Justice, that says, you know, you're going to face a challenge that this, the action or the course that you're going to take is not going to be considered uh, to be legal by some. And a president's reaction, you know, to that being akin to this, <clears throat> let me worry about that. I'll let me do what I need to do. You do what you need to do. Um, you know, tell them you're looking into it. Let me worry about the legal stuff. Um, again, it, it, is, uh, is that evidence of, of criminal misconduct? Could be. Could be. But, uh, uh, you know, s sorting that out bef before a, a fair-minded jury, assuming that there's a fair-minded jury, is, I, I think, another question. But it is, is it conceivable that with the right evidence that it is possible to say pressure on the president's own Department of Justice could be part of a, could be part yeah. of a crime? Of course, and that, you know, in the, in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, Jack Smith has made that judgment that that has crossed over the line. And in fact, you know, even his indictment seems to sort of concede the possibility about a lot of this conduct to a degree is, you might even say, an error in judgment or reprehensible or, you know, some negative connotation, but not necessarily criminal. And he concedes as much, but he's now going to have to prove, you know, that, uh, okay, conceding that much 
I am going to have to prove that the president went over that line, whatever that line is. They get access to John Eastman's memos, the January 6th committee, and the, and the judge uses a crime fraud exception to do it. What do you think of that moment of, of that decision? That's significant in a case because otherwise those materials would be privileged, likely. Um, the only real recognized exception to overcome it would be that it was advice rendered in connection with a crime and the crime fraud exception applies, and therefore the, that material um, will, uh, in all likelihood, come into evidence. I mean, there may be other objections that I'm not, you know, appreciating at the moment, but it, it obviously is a significant piece, area of, of evidence, uh, and that was a significant moment in the investigation. Not, no question about that. Why? Because it, because it gives you a window on intent. You're getting, you're getting people's contemporaneous uh, recollections and understanding about what people, including the president, were thinking at the time, which is obviously something that's very important for a prosecutor to have in order to persuade a jury why the president's actions were consistent with criminal intent as opposed to an innocent reason. And they become pretty central to this whole to, to understanding, as you say, they, they, these memos, there's a series of, of John Eastman memos where his thinking evolves over time and he goes from saying, you know, the, the president can't just reject them to, to writing memos where he says that the vice president has the power to, to reject or decide which electors uh, of his own want to, to accept. I assume you've read the memos or, or, or read about them. What, what do they add to the case or, or what's the, the challenge of them? I think you probably can expect to hear from the defense, at least in part, on that. If it were so, if it was so clear, um, why did the vice president need to seek legal advice about it? First, second, if it was so clear, why did Congress see fit thereafter to change um, the electoral act um, to make it clear for the future that the vice president's actions in that regard are? entirely, purely ministerial. Um, I think that, again, I understand where it's with the benefit now of 2020 hindsight, everybody wants to say, well, this was an absolutely clear decision. It didn't require anybody to think twice about it. And the vice president doesn't have that authority and he doesn't have the constitutional ability to do anything other than to just simply determine that there are certifications that come from the respective states and to submit to the, them to the Congress for that reason and to approve them. Um, but, but again, I think scholars have long recognized, legal scholars, constitutional scholars, have long recognized that those provisions of the Constitution and the corresponding provisions of the, um, the Electoral Act uh, were not as clear as they, they could or should be. And I do think in that area there is room for the defense to, um, to, to exploit and to, and to operate. I mean, it seems like a technicality, right? The idea that the vice president could, you know, even if there was a loophole in the law, it seems like that's what, what it is. But, but if it is a loophole and it is a, a potential technicality that could be, you know, possibly justified, then that might be enough for a defense, even though it's disenfranchising the voters. Yeah, but that's a political judgment, right? I mean, that, that, that's the political process. That's why we have elections in, in order to sort out. We don't sort those things out um, with the benefit of hindsight. That's why we have ex post facto provisions in the Constitution that make it uh, unconstitutional to charge somebody with sort of a roving offense that changes, you know, based upon what you think now as opposed to what was in effect at the time that the defendant allegedly committed the act, right? So. You know, it's, it's decidedly unfair and inconsistent with due process to be, you know, trying to sort through and make those judgments and say that the criminal law should stick to them if, for example, in this case, I think you're going to hear evidence from the defendants, the president's lawyers, uh, to the effect that Mike Pence didn't know on his own. That's why he consulted with uh, Judge Ludig, and I think uh, further, uh, why the Congress decided that if it wasn't clear with regard to what the intention of this act was consistent with the Constitution, that the vice president's duties are, um, are, are you know, purely ministerial, 
um, that, um, you know, you need to say so. I mean, you know, there's a counter argument. It's like he's the vice president of the United States. He's the president of the Senate. He's obviously entrusted with constitutional authority. I don't think it was an accident of the framers to entrust the vice president, the only other elected official by all the people in the country, to make a determination about certifying electors that determine the presidency with the only other alternative being throwing the election into the House of Representatives. I think you could still make a plausible case, as apparently Eastman did. You may not find it to be persuasive, but I think you could make a plausible case that the, pres the vice president in that circumstance as the president of the Senate has some inherent constitutional authority to reject. And if, if, and if you didn't think that that was the case, then um, the Constitution vests the, the Congress with the authority through legislation to clear up the ambiguity, which they subsequently did. And in that subsequently uh, clearing, a clearing of the ambiguity, the, there is room for a defense to say, well, if it was so clear, how come the Congress had to change the law? And you're, you can't stick me with a, a, a violation of the criminal law by asking uh, the vice president to do something about which there is some constitutional and statutory ambiguity. We haven't heard from Pence. We've seen little glimpses of it inside the indictment. Uh, um, we've heard from his advisors. We've heard from people around him. How important, I mean, if he testifies at the trial, could his testimony be? I mean, it's alleged I think that it the could president be. said, you know, you're too honest at one point. Um, I mean, how, how important could, could Pence's testimony be? I think it could be important. Um, I, I think if, he, if he's called, I think it will be important. I don't think you should assume that he's going to throw former President Trump under the bus either. I mean, I, you know, I think he's been clear in his book and otherwise about what he thought his obligations were. But if you start getting into the question about whether or not, uh, you know, I don't know whether this would be admissible at trial, but I mean, I think the gist of your question is, you know, what does Mike Pence really think about whether or not Donald Trump acted unlawfully? Um, the government won't be able to ask that, that question directly, but there'll be ways if, if he were a witness at trial that they'll sort of cover that territory. I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that, that Mike Pence is going to be a favorable witness for the prosecution. And, and just so it's clear, in a, in a, not in a political context, because he has basically thrown the, pres the former president under the bus yes. in a political context. I'm talking about in a, in a criminal context with Mike Pence under oath, which I know he takes very seriously, at a criminal trial to testify truthfully. You know, the oath that, that, that every witness takes. Do you, do, you, do, you, um, do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God? I can tell you that Mike Pence takes that oath seriously and that he will tell the truth. On, on that thing, I, I don't actually know what Mike Pence would say. As we get to January 6th, um you talked about the speech. I mean, I think that the case that the January 6th committee would make and that the prosecutors will probably make is that the president was told that there were weapons in the crowd. He had said before internally that he wanted to go with uh, with the protesters at the Capitol, that it wasn't a, a spur of the moment statement, that he knew that Mike Pence had said that he wasn't going to go along. And yet he goes out and he gives the speech and he does use the word peacefully, but he also says fight like hell. And he says fight um, repeatedly. And they allege in the indictment that he was sending a large and angry crowd towards the Capitol, that he knew was a large and angry crowd and that the intent yeah. of fight, it was to fight, to fight like hell is a political euphemism. I, I think, again, trying to turn that into um, quote unquote, fighting words equivalent to sh shouting fire in a the uh, theater uh, is, a, is a pretty huge leap, particularly in light of the president's disclaimer that, um, that the, the protest should be peaceful. I, I, I mean, I honestly think this one to me is the most problematic. You want to turn that one into a crime. I, I think that is a decidedly bad idea. I, I just do. Um, and I, I think it has a major First Amendment problem. Um, and I think that, um, you know, my, my view as a prosecutor would be I'd have trouble bringing that charge because the prosecutor's obligation is to bring a charge in which the prosecutor believes, not just that there's probable cause to return an indictment, but a good faith belief that a fair-minded jury would convict on that charge and that that, that prosecution um, would be sustainable under existing law, including on, on appeal. And I do not find that charge to be sustainable, irrespective of whether a jury could return a verdict on it. 
I do not find that charge to be sustainable on appeal for First Amendment reasons. I, I just, that, that's a bad idea. You don't like what happened there about what the president said? Remove him from office, okay? Don't elect him president of the United States ever again. That, that's the solution to that one. Now, do I understand that there's, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of degree? I mean, you don't have to actually have a loaded weapon to be able to say, you know, you should have known better that if you said certain things, it was going to lead to direct act of violence. I, I think it's a real reach, though, to, to suggest based upon at least the, the facts that, as I know them under the circumstances in which they were given to hold the president to account for what happened about people, you know, um, trespassing on the Capitol and breaking windows and going in um, in, in a, what people have characterized as a um, a violent, you know, deadly protest. I, I, I think, um, I, I don't think that's an area that is, is suited to the application of the criminal law, and I think it has a major constitutional problem, including the First Amendment. I had meant to ask you, and I didn't, and you probably say the same thing about the tweet that he sends in December saying, you know, we'll be wild, come to Washington. Again, that's why there's a First Amendment. <laughs> you're, you're given a big amount of latitude to say a lot of wild and crazy, even stupid things without having to worry about somebody afterwards deciding that you should be sent to jail for it. And the, the specific thing I think they would say is, he said, you know, go to the Capitol, I will be there with you. Which but, he wasn't, right? Which, which he I mean, wasn't. The evidence is maybe he tried to go and he wasn't able to, but, but that that was not just riling them up, that that was an action directing the crowd towards towards the Capitol. I mean, do you really think that was, well, I mean, that's the argument they're going to make. Do you really think that was directing them to do those, all of those acts? I, I, I think that's a stretch. I don't think they're going to be able to present evidence that would be able to make that um, stick uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, again, I think there should be room under the First Amendment and otherwise for the president to say an awful lot without having to tag him with a criminal offense. Um, you know, and that's separate and apart from whether or not He's covered by, you know, immunity. Um, it, it's just simply the zone that the, the First Amendment protects. And I think trying to immediately draw the conclusion, um, you know, that uh, we're, we're going to go to the Capitol and raise hell um, and, and fight like hell, that that's the same thing as, you know, pinning the tail on the donkey. I don't think that, that it's the same, no. And I think it's, it, it's particularly problematic, particularly even in the political process, for the committee to sort of travel down that road and intentionally exclude what the president said that they shouldn't do, that it should be a peaceful protest. I, you know, to me, um, I, I'm not even sure, well, I, I think it's a close call and I, I don't have any doubt about what this judge is going to do, but I would have a hard time, I think, or at least I would be contemplating whether or not I even allow a jury to hear that. Once the government's evidence is, I, and I, I might change my view based upon what other evidence the government develops, but I think there'd be a serious question if the uh, defense makes a motion um, that uh, at the end, at the close of the government's case, that no rational jury could convict the defendant on that charge. I, I think I might get some serious consideration of saying, you know what, you're right, that doesn't go to the jury. So as we come to the, the end of the story, to the end of this interview, too, I just want to ask you a couple of things about where we are now. And, and the first is Jack Smith. I don't know if you know him or know about who he is. You do know you didn't have exactly the same job, but a, a similar job. What position is he in and how will you evaluate you know, how he's operating? It's a very difficult position to be in. He's entrusted with the authority of, 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 of trying to prosecute a, a former president who happens to be a candidate in this election cycle, and to be able to pull that off consistent with public sentiment, to have people walk away from this on both sides after the process plays out, believing that the process was fair. I, I mean, right now, if we had to make an evaluation as we sit here in the moment, I think you have about half the country that thinks has already concluded that that, that process is not fair. And that's, that's not a, an enviable uh, position to be in. I mean, what you hope as a prosecutor given the powers that you're entrusted with, is that on a bipartisan, nonpartisan basis, people will come to accept your judgments and decisions about bringing and prosecuting a case as, as, as being fundamentally consistent with, with the Constitution and our system of justice, which is equal justice under law and without favor um, or, or prejudice to any person. 
I think about half the country right now doesn't believe that. That's not a good result. No matter what the actual results are in the courtroom, that to me is troubling and disheartening. Whatever your views, whether in favor of, of former President Trump or, or not in favor of former President Trump, that is not a happy place for the country to be.